May we open with a word of prayer, please. O God, our Heavenly Father, we invoke the presence of thy divine Spirit. We thank thee that he was pleased to move the Apostle Paul to write these wonderful words for the perennial guidance of the Christian Church until Jesus comes again. And as we deliberate on this particularly vital portion this morning, we pray that thou wilt illumine us, not only in the understanding of it, but the reception of it and the propagation of it by word and life. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen. Now, in a continuing study of the book of Philippians, we come this morning to Philippians 1, 12 to 20. I think you all have the outlines that we're following in our discussion. It should read 1, verses 12 through 20. Let me read my brief captions to get an overview of this section before we see the text itself and uh, examine it and discuss it together. First, Paul's prison is a pulpit for the propagation of the gospel, making his captors the captives of the gospel, and making courageous witnesses of other Christians. Paul made the gospel of Christ advance even through personal enemies who turned out themselves to be orthodox Christian preachers, I should have put in that uh, caption. But coming back now to the very first section, we read Philippians 1, 12, the first part of verse 13. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ. It has been often observed that the people who go to prison are usually those who are notably immoral, but frequently it's because those who are notably moral. They're so moral that the culture doesn't know what to do with them and actually regards them as offenders, when as a matter of fact they are supreme defenders of genuine law and order. But here it is that just as truly as our Lord was imprisoned and executed as a uh, insurgent and rebel and violator of the peace, and false prophet, and blasphemer, and everything else. So his most noted disciple is not surprisingly found in prison also. You remember the process which led to the apostles' imprisonment began with Jewish people in Jerusalem. Ultimately, you remember the apostle being a Roman citizen, though himself a Jew, appealed to Caesar, and that's what ultimately brought him to Caesar, who ultimately, in the second imprisonment, after this one, actually uh, executed him. It's noticeable also that the apostle, as I say, uh, the twelfth apostle, and probably the greatest apostle of all time, the Moses of the New Testament, certainly the one who has unfolded by the divine spirit more of the Christian religion than anyone, including Jesus Christ himself. Christ is the Christian religion. But Christ said a great deal less about the essential doctrines of the Christian religion than he was pleased to see through this apostle of his. I mentioned a couple years ago, we were discussing a point similar to this, that there have been some scholars who have insisted on referring to Christianity as Paulinism. So tremendous is the influence of the apostle. That, of course, was devastating, refuted by, devastatingly refuted by Machen's famous book, The Origin of Paul's Religion. It showed so overwhelmingly that so far from that being any different religion of Jesus or any deviation, therefore, it was nothing less than the religion of Jesus Christ spelled out in its fullness. But it is virtually impossible to exaggerate the role of the Apostle Paul in the further unfolding of the Christian faith, and probably the greatest exemplification of it that ever has been given us. You remember repeatedly, and even in this epistle, as we'll notice later, the Apostle Paul unhesitatingly commands us to follow him as he follows Jesus Christ. We learn things about following Christ from his Apostle that we can't even learn from Christ. For example, how to repent of sin. Christ can't exemplify for us, for he had no sin 
of which to repent. He could command us to repent, but he couldn't show us how to repent because he had nothing of which to repent. This awful battle that the apostle talks about in Romans 7, that which I would, I do not, and so on, never characterized our Lord who was serenely and perfectly sanctified. He was tempted in all points as we, but he never succumbed to them. And he never had to extricate himself from actual evil. And the apostle, the disciple whom he supremely chose for that particular role of showing us how to follow him, especially the apostle Paul, all ministers are supposed particularly to do that. Parents are supposed to do that for their children. We all have that responsibility to a degree, not only for ourselves, but for others who learn the gospel from our lips and even more from our lies, but certainly among the disciples of Christ, Paul was preeminently his apostle and example. At the same time, that great as he is, elevated above all the servants of Jesus Christ, a supreme medium for the revelation of Jesus Christ, he very calmly writes to these humble Philippian Corinthians, Christians, as brethren. I want you to know brethren. He could always throw his weight around. He had apostolic authority. What he said was the word of God and requires us to obey implicitly, just as we recognize here. This letter that we are studying, though it was written by Paul, it was inspired by the Spirit of God and commands immediate and perfect obedience on our part, both in faith and practice. But this man recognizes he's a sinner saved by grace. Indeed, he insists on the fact he's the chief of sinners, a greater sinner than any of us has ever been, which most of us would consider no mean achievement, I suppose. But he nevertheless calls us brethren. It's interesting to note, too, how he remarks that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. This is the greatest predestinarian next to Jesus Christ the church has ever had absolutely certain of the fixed counsel of God in every meticulous detail, ordained from all eternity, yet he doesn't hesitate to talk about his circumstances turning out for good, (coughs) somewhat the way casual Arminians and deliberate liberals and so on act as if these events are more or less loose and they gradually take place. It's very wonderful when they happen the way you want them to and rather frustrating if they happen some other way. These circumstances that turn out for his good, mind you, turn out for his greater progress, has actually turned out for his imprisonment. That's another tricky little turn in the phrase here. You would suppose he would be lugubrious and downcast because his circumstances, even if he knew they were the circumstances God had ordained, and under under a perfect divine control, at the same time when they turn out to put him in the Mamertine prison, creeping with uh, all sorts of insects and every conceivable kind of liability and ultimate martyrdom and so on, that wouldn't be exactly the job description of what we would call turning out for greater progress, but it's greater progress of the gospel. And if God is going to advance his gospel by our suffering, that's exactly what we want. We may not like the suffering. We might wish God would do it some other way. But the one thing we are really interested in is the advance of the gospel. And as long as we can be sure that no matter what happens to us, the gospel is going to be advanced. That's all we ask. I mentioned yesterday morning to the Kansas uh, group over here at uh, church on Rock Road and so on. Somebody asked me, what do you do with tragedy? I said, what's tragedy? For a Christian, there is no such thing. There ain't no such word in the vocabulary. It has no meaning for us. Because anything, however adverse in circumstance may be, however painful it may be, excruciating if you please, We know it's going to work for our good and it's going to promote the gospel. Tragedy? How do you spell the word? On the other hand, for a non-Christian, everything's tragedy. When he gets an advancement in his job, when he finds a woman he wants to marry, when he has the ideal children in the family, when everything is turning up daisies and so on, he is profoundly unfortunate. You weep for that man's prosperity. It's only adding to the wrath of God against him because all these good fortunes of his simply are an occasion for his unbelief to exercise itself and heap up wrath against the day of wrath. So for the 
unbeliever, everything is tragedy, especially prosperity. And for the believer, everything is prosperity, especially adversity. Let's look at this next phrase. I want you to, uh, uh, let me read this once again. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances are turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ, reading down uh, Philippians 1, 13, 14, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. See, Paul is a great theorist, and he usually develops a principle first and then gives you an illustration. So you wonder how in the world his miserable imprisonment would actually promote the cause of the gospel. Well, he gets down to the ta- details, and he tells you that his very Im- guard who incarcerated him and kept him in confinement and so on, they were being reached by the way in which he endured so triumphantly these very straightened circumstances of it. And those Christian people who were lamenting the, quote, misfortune of the apostles' imprisonment, seeing how gloriously he triumphed over it and how he was actually reaching the people who were inflicting this adversity on him, it gave them who were timid and lacking in courage on occasion and a gross minority, utterly outnumbered by the impressive Roman legions and the majesty of the Roman citadel and so on, the courage as a minority group to speak about a despised Jew who was crucified on a Roman cross and so on. Now, what more could an evangelist want than to have people like that, normally intimidated by the circumstances, pick up courage because of the way in which the man who actually suffered what they were afraid of suffering. They weren't suffering. Some of them have undoubtedly gone underground. Some undoubtedly were not confessing Christ. Some undoubtedly were so frightened. That's the thing we're talking about the next time. And one of the hard sayings of Christ, that confessing Christ before men is necessary for salvation. So though the apostle doesn't develop it here, when he calls our attention to the fact that his suffering encouraged other professed believers to put themselves in a position of suffering to or hazard their lives by confessing Christ is absolutely necessary if a person is going to be acknowledged before God and the holy angels. So it's not only that these seemingly timid Christians were encouraged by Paul's fortitude to become witnessing Christians and thus stronger Christians, but it's altogether conceivable that it was this circumstance of the apostle generating courage in them, which is actually what saved them. You get me on that? What I'm trying to say is, is a group of people around Rome, a decided minority. Remember, we're near the time of Nero and the beginning of these awful Roman persecutions, and undoubtedly many of them were keeping a very low profile. They were certainly not sticking out their neck not even for Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ had warned them solemnly that if they didn't confess him before men, he would not confess them before the Father. And so it may well be that Paul's example not only stirred genuine Christians to greater zeal and courage in the proclamation of the gospel, but may have convinced some persons that this is the way of the Christian life, and if you're going to be a true follower of Christ, you've got to suffer. And some of them who thought they were converted actually realized they weren't, and this may very well have led not only to the fortitude of real Christians, but to the conversion of merely nominal ones. Any questions on that? Do you catch uh, the point I'm saying? I'm not saying that's necessarily the case. It is certainly possibly the case, and I would assume it's even probably the case, because surely a great many persons who call themselves Christians don't do any confessing of Jesus Christ in any circumstance which in any way, in the slightest bit, threatens them. And Jesus Christ makes it very, very plain, as does the apostle, that they can't be Christians that way. And it may well be, as I say, seeing an ideal Christian suffer just as his Lord had before, 
made these persons realize they weren't even Christians at all. But at any rate, some of them were truly strengthened in their witness. Another thing is this. Uh, I think, I don't know if it was in this class or another class, but we commented uh, a few weeks ago in uh, some connection here with this statement of our Lord about uh, letting your light so shine before men that they may behold your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And I was mentioning that most of us tend to take that statement of our Lord in a very positive and rather unjustifiably positive manner. That is, we get this idea that if we live a truly Christian life, we will become immensely attractive persons. And we will just normally woo people by the persuasiveness of the light which shines by our good works into discipleship. Well, I mentioned to you at that time that the way that works is that men are not naturally attracted by the light of the gospel. They are naturally repelled by it. As Jesus says, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And what happened? Men loved the darkness rather than the light. They try, as John says in the first chapter, to overcome the light, to extinguish the light, to suppress the light. Consequently, if your light shines, as Jesus says it should shine, so far from it attracting the world, it's going to repel the world. How then, is the question, do you glorify God thereby? Christ says, remember, let your light so shine that men may behold your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. If the tendency of your good works, light shining, is to alienate rather than attract because men hate the light shining through you and love the darkness you're trying to dissipate, how does that glorify God? You could see how it would end in your imprisonment. You could see how not martyrdom would be par for the course. But how would that glorify God? Well, you see, the way it glorifies God through Paul. He's put in prison, to be sure. He's rejected by his culture. He's ultimately martyred. Greatest saint who ever lived, just like his Lord before him, virtually crucified. But in the process of it, we've already seen Christians are wonderfully strengthened by it. Non-Christians are, while hostile, as undoubtedly the Praetorian Guard, I can almost hear the kind of talk they would have, boy, is this guy a sucker. He could have avoided all this type of thing if he hadn't riled those Jews in Jerusalem or come to terms with them quickly, and doesn't he foolishly appeal to Caesar and so on. All they would have seen of this brilliant man, a manifest genius, a person of tremendous influence ending up in a stinking prison and so on, is that he's a colossal idiot, a real fool for Jesus Christ. That was the first reaction. But the more they heard him and the more they saw that light, the more convinced they were that he was right and they were wrong. He was in prison and they were the free people, but they knew very well in the last analysis it was right for him to be in jail and it was wrong for them not to be in jail. And it got to them. And that's the way the conversion came about. So what we have here is a specific illustration of the way Christ's mandate is carried out to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They will incriminate you in the first instance because you will be a living indictment of them and you will have your particular form of crucifixion. But in the process, if they are going to be converted at all, it'll be in context such as that and all genuine Christians will be greatly sanctified through that example of yours. Now let's look at the latter part of this, which is by far the uh, more extensive uh, part and also very, very uh, significant about 
Christian witnesses in their relationship to one another. Let me read now Philippians 1, 15 to 20, if there's no question about what we have looked at uh, so far. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ ever even from envy and strife, I think that should be, but some also from good will. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision that the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. This first proposition I make under that is that some ministers preach Christ of ill will as truly as others do from good will. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from good will. Now, that's the first thing one has to face. And you recognize in this context, Paul isn't talking about liberalism, which is no gospel at all. He's talking about people who really preach Christ. We would call them fundamentalists. We would say they're conservatives. We're talking here about evangelicals. These are people who preach the real Christ and the real gospel, and so on. But nevertheless, some of them in Philippi at that time, and undoubtedly some of them in Wichita and in Pittsburgh and in the world, in our time, are preaching Christ but of ill will. It's a sobering, shaking fact. We know the gospel is true. We have a tendency to suppose that anyone who declares the truth is himself true. But we're alerted to the fact that that is not always the case. And therefore, we cannot assume that because a man is, quote, sound in the faith, that he is therefore truly right in his spirit or soul. He actually can preach the good news of an ill or bad will, a bad motivation for good news. We have to face it. Now, why does, why does the apostle tell us about this? Why did Jesus Christ warn us that some shepherds are wolves in sheep's clothing? And we are to discriminate ourselves about them. Now, Christ doesn't only mean that some are false shepherds with a false message which will lead the sheep astray, but presumably he too is indicating that some who are preaching the shepherd's message are themselves wolves. Why would wolves preach a message which would benefit the sheep? Well, there are various and sundry reasons. We'll get into that, I suppose, before the discussion is over. Right now, I just simply want to impress upon you the fact that a person in my role, I'm preaching the truth, I'm a fundamentalist, I'm a conservative, I'm an evangelical, I believe the Bible from cover to cover, Calvinist, orthodox as they come, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, if you please. And the apostle is saying very, very plainly that that doesn't prove that my spirit is right, that my will is good. And as far as I or Frank or Buck or anybody else is concerned, there's always the possibility that while the news we give is good, the will with which we give it is not good. So for Frank and Buck and I and all the rest of us, we must search our own hearts. And the first lesson is for us 
we dare not assume that just because we preach the truth and we're not heretics, we therefore are true lovers of Jesus Christ and human souls. And if that's true of me, it's equally true of you to a lesser degree. That is, you are professional preachers. You're not ordained teachers, but you all of you are witnesses. All of you are teaching somewhere, someplace, sometime, and I trust all of you are teaching the true Christ. You have to be careful, too. If I must be, you must be careful, too, lest you suppose that because the message you give is good, the spirit which moves you to give it is also good. That should be the case. That's not necessarily the case. I think with respect to our opinions of one another, we ought to give what the Puritans would call this judgment of charity. Sometimes we use a secular expre expression, benefit of the doubt, if a doubt does arise. I think you ought to consider me a person of goodwill, unless there is clear and indubitable evidence to the contrary. Same with Frank and Buck, and so on. And I, the same with you. But at the same time, when Scripture alerts us to the fact, and Scripture doesn't teach us things for no purpose, doesn't inform us so that this would have no meaning for us, we have to recognize, I for myself, you for yourself, that just because we're sound in the faith, we are not necessarily sound in the heart. Some, to be sure, that matter-of-fact expression, as if this isn't you, Matter of fact, when Paul was preaching, you know, in that last missionary journey to the ministers, the episcopoi, remember we were talking about them, the bishops who were also elders and so on, at Miletus, he warned them that some, even of them, would come as wolves after his departure to devour that very flock. And you remember, they were so sentimental, I wrote in your... East Wind last year, you know, sentimentalism is the greatest of the heresies of our time, I suppose. Does somebody have a question? Yes, please. Right. Um, if someone is teaching the word out of an ill motive, is the Lord still going to use them? Are the people going to be nourished? They are. The they are. You, you see, before this passage is over, you're going to do more than that. But hang in there, and if I get finished with this passage without answering the question, bring it up again, will you? But I think the text, and certainly the way I develop it, will, uh, will bring that out. Sorry, I didn't notice your hand before. I'm, I'm glad you persist, too, and please, uh, all of you do that. When you have a question, I get preoccupied with what I'm saying. I guess you could look me in the face and raise your hand. I might not see it. You're dealing with an absent-minded professor. You know that. But this is the thing. Going back to that sentimentalism of the uh, Christian ministers at that particular time, you know what moved them? As far as the record was concerned, they didn't say a word about the fact that Paul had prophesied that shortly after he left them, some of them would turn into wolves devouring the flock. You would have thought, dear Paul, is this possible? How in the world can we prevent it? Or saying as the apostles did at the Last Supper, is it I? But you know what they did? They wept on Paul because he had said they would never see his face again. That's the only thing that mattered to them. They would never see the beloved Paul again. That's a good thing. I and mean, of course you realize I'm not excoriating genuine Christian affection. But that that sort of thing, important as it is, could actually dislodge any attention to the dreadfully threatening event that Paul had predicted is an instance of this disease of sentimentalism actually dispossessing a true and proper concern for, for people. But at any rate, we are to know this and we are to examine ourselves particularly. We are to judge others with a judgment of charity, but we have to be open to the fact that this sort of thing can happen. This is a main problem in mainline denominations at the present time. Everybody who ever candidates for any pulpit in almost any mainline denomination sounds as orthodox as John Calvin. He acts as if he believes everything. Many of them believe next to nothing. Years ago, when I was doing my doctoral work at a great liberal institution, the 
as people, uh, candidates for the ministry used to think it was a great thing to joke about the way they would recite the Apostles' Creed, born of the Virgin Mary, and not believe a word of it. I've had people appear before presbytery, students have told me, who don't believe a thing that they're asked, but they'll swear up and down they do, and afterwards ridicule the presbyters for daring to ask them the question. There are vicious persons. There always have been. Paul states it as a matter of fact. You have to know it. I repeat for the third time now, because this is very important, first of all, to get this lesson, and secondly, not to act wrongly about the lesson. That is, you don't suspect everybody, you see. As a matter of fact, you give a judgment of charity, and you are not convinced a person is a pastor of ill will until the evidence is irresistible. But nevertheless, the possibility is there. And now notice how the apostle continues. The good will preachers are motivated by love. What makes a good will preacher is the fact that he really loves Jesus Christ, whom he preaches so fervently, and he loves the people to whom he preaches as well. He loves even those who hate him. He loves those with a special affection who love him in Christ Jesus. In every particular church, there are those who are strangers to the gospel as well as those who love them. But a true pastor loves them all. But there's a difference in the way a Christian loves other persons. We are commanded to love even our enemies. Now, you can't love enemies with a love of complacency. You love enemies with a love of benevolence. That is, you do good to those who do evil to you. You have that kind of love. But for those who really love the gospel and love Jesus Christ and love you in the gospel, you have for them not only a love of benevolence but a love of complacency as well. But one thing characterizes the goodwill preachers, not only that they're sound in what they say, but they are motivated by love in all that they do. The goodwill preachers work for the true minister of the word as well as for the word is brought out in this uh, passage here. You see, the goodwill ministers don't say alone, I am interested in Jesus Christ and getting people saved and advancing the gospel. They are also identified with other persons who are clearly doing the same thing. It's a characteristic of ill will gospel preachers that they ring the changes on their fidelity to the gospel they preach and the Christ they proclaim, but it's at the expense rather than for the assistance of others who are likewise faithful in the gospel. Here are these Philippian preachers. If they really love the Christ, they declared so fervently, why wouldn't they have a supreme affection for the supreme preacher of Jesus Christ? the Apostle Paul. How is it possible for anybody to have a real love, a true love for Jesus Christ and not have a love for fellow Christians? And preacher to preacher, if a man really loves the Christ he preaches, he is going to love the person who also preaches Jesus Christ. He's not going to be at enmity with him. He's not going to hate him and love Christ not going to love Christ and hate another preacher of Christ. That just can't be. Something false at that. So you examine yourself. I examine myself. Do I say, I preach Christ and love Christ, but I don't love other people who preach Christ? If that was the case, there's something wrong. I'm preaching a Christ of contention. I'm preaching a Christ of ill will. I'm not preaching a Christ of love. If I don't love those who are doing the same thing, you see, it's fairly easy to say. I love Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, we'd be scared silly not to say so. It's a little easier to recognize with respect to a concrete fellow human being, fellow professional in the same business and in a kind of competition who may be more outwardly successful than you are and so on. It might be much easier to recognize whether you really resent his success in the gospel, or the way in which the Lord is promoting his work. Certainly, when a person examines himself, it would be very, very difficult to overlook the fact that he is eaten up with enmity. 
that in spite of everything he professes about his love for Jesus Christ, here is a fellow Christian he does not love. He may not say it to the person's face, but he knows in his heart that's the case, and if so, then he meets the description of these Philippian preachers of the good news with a bad will. The ill four, number four, the ill will gospel preachers do so not from love but from selfish ambition. Now you're getting at the root of the matter. You would think when a person preaches Christ crucified, it's because he was at the cross when they crucified his Lord. You just can't imagine someone devoting his life to the proclamation of the crucified one and not have any love for him. It's hard for me as a religious person to understand anybody going into chemistry or science or uh, aeronautics or anything else. He didn't have a love for it. It sort of scrambles my brain a bit to see a person devoting his life to any kind of calling if he really wasn't motivated. But I realize sometimes people get dislocated and they've got to make their bread and butter and this is the job that's available and what they want to do they can't find and such things as that. I, I can understand that happening, but where a person has any real option in the matter, choosing to be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, and he didn't like it, it's really difficult to understand. It's impossible to understand how a person could choose to devote his life to proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified and not really love Jesus Christ and him crucified. But here it is. Paul says very plainly, they did it from selfish ambition. They are preaching Jesus Christ, motivated by themselves. They may, we'll see in a moment, apropos your question, they may move multitudes themselves to a love of Jesus Christ, but they are not moved by it. What actually moves them is selfish ambition. Now here we have to pause again for station identification. Paul could say that. I can't say that, and you can't say that. I can't search people's hearts. Neither can you. But the Apostle Paul, you remember, was not only an apostle, but he had miraculous powers, as all the apostles did. And just as truly as Peter could look at Simon the magician and say he was in the bond of iniquity and the gall of bitterness, just as truly as he could search the hearts of Ananias and Sapphira and realize that they were hypocrites and bring judgment upon them, so the Apostle Paul could actually know the hearts of these people who were preaching such a sound gospel and say with the authority that only God can assume their motivation is selfish ambition. I can suspect it, and you can guess it. And we might be able to build up a reasonable surmise. But you and I almost never, unless the person himself admits it, can be sure that another person is motivated, how another person is motivated. And least of all, can we be sure how a Christian minister is motivated. All of our preference and predilection and inclination would be in the opposite direction, as I say, that a person who preached Christ crucified must love Jesus Christ. He can't be doing that, we would say, from selfish ambition. But he can. And in these cases, he actually did, and we have to be aware of it. Isn't all we're really talking about here whether the Christian minister has actually undergone regeneration or not? Yes. Yes. If a person, for example, the question is here, whether we are here asking whether the Christian ministers in uh, question here have undergone regeneration or not. The implication is very clear. Not stated, but if a person is preaching Christ for selfish ambition, he's a hypocrite and a liar. And hypocrites and liars have not been born again. So your question brings out another aspect of the matter, implicit, but very inescapable, I would say, that a person who preaches Jesus Christ soundly and does so from selfish ambition and animosity to other preachers whom they don't love but actually hate and so on, is not born again. So you have the conclusion 
that a person can preach Christ crucified and not even be born again. Because these evidences here point to an unregenerate person. This reminds me of the principle. You take your second question already, right? This reminds me, let me get this word in edgewise a moment. This reminds me of the principle I think I mentioned in this class uh, last week, that anything that is taught by the Bible implicitly is just as truly taught by the Bible as anything it says explicitly. Uh, what I mean by that is, if it is clear, now see, the Bible isn't saying, apropos the question before us, that these Christian ministers are unregenerate. I am saying it's inferring that. Why? Because it says they preach Christ of ill will and selfish ambition. And they profess, by the preaching of Christ, to be devoted to him. That makes them liars and hypocrites in the most sacred of all professions. And to be a liar and a hypocrite is to be unregenerate. Therefore, the Bible is saying implicitly that persons, be they ministers or whatever, who preach Christ however soundly, but motivated by selfish ambition and so on, are unregenerate. Yes, sir. Very good question. The question is probing this matter uh, further as it uh, ought well to be. And that is this. Is it possible for a person now who preaches Christ of goodwill because he really loves Christ and he loves the Apostle Paul and he loves the Word of God and so on, is it possible for him to have some selfish ambition and some ill will? Just as the question puts it, all Christians have some of, the, of this also. Very true that it is possible, not only possible, it's absolutely certain. Suppose, for example, I am a person of goodwill as well as a preacher of the truth. Suppose that to be the case, as I hope it is, and I believe it is, and I'll ask you in a ju judgment of charity to think it is, and so on. Suppose that is the case. Does that mean that I'm free of ambition, and I have no jealousy, and that no ill will ever creeps into my being? Not at all. No, no. Any true Christian is imperfect, and he has his weaknesses. Just as when Christ said at the Last Supper, one of you will betray me, everyone probably except Judas said, Lord, is it I? Now the question, the third question, Randy would like to wait, but I, he can't raise it, but I'll raise it for him because I know it's in the back of his mind and your mind also at this particular juncture, if that is true. That a Christian minister and a fellow Christian, because everything I'm saying about the minister, because this is what the text is dealing with, apply to all of you, because in your own way, you are ministers unordained, and so on. But if that is the case, then what's the difference between these preachers of selfish ambition and ill will and persons who have basically a good will? Well, there's the answer right there, the basically so. If a person is a true Christian, take the Apostle Paul. We know he was a true preacher of Christ. He was far from perfect, as he'll be telling us before this book is over. He didn't consider himself to have obtained. He was pressing on for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, but he was basically so. I'm sure Paul had ambition. I'm sure Paul had some ill will. Paul recognized himself not to be perfect. The difference is the fundamental character, the basic character of his being, and of any other true being, and myself, if I am what I say I am, is that we are not fundamentally people of ill will. We are not fundamentally persons who are ambitious. We repent of such things, and we struggle to overcome them. Whereas a person of real ill will motivation, where that's the character of his inner nature, that person is committed to it. He allows himself in the practice of it. That is the basic difference there. Number five, they aim at hurting true preachers of truth rather than helping Christ. That's where they get their kicks. Not in people being converted and angels rejoicing in heaven, but the fact that they made a point against Paul. They embarrassed the true gospel. Boy, they had a good day. They got somebody to think ill of Paul. Make him out a fool or something like that. That's what motivates them. Strange as it may see, they aim at hurting true preachers, the apostle says here. Nevertheless, and here's your question, you see. Nevertheless, 
True preachers rejoice when Christ is preached up even though they are preached down. This is the interesting thing here about the apostle. He rejoices in this preaching of Christ. He's happy about it. Even though he knows that these people preach Christ from ill will and even selfish ambition and primarily to hurt him. Now, he doesn't rejoice in their ill will, their selfish ambition, or their attempt to or success in hurting him. But he rejoices in one thing. He keeps his eye on the ball, as we say. He notices the all-important thing. They preach Christ. That he will not forget. They hurt him. They destroy themselves. But they preach Christ, and in that he will rejoice. The best way to get the significance of this is to compare the first chapter of Philippians, which we're now reading, with, of course, the first chapter of Galatians. Remember what he said there? If I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which has been preached to you, let him be accursed. See, what was troubling the Galatians were people who were preaching another gospel which wasn't another gospel. And so far from Paul rejoicing in that, he called down an anathema from heaven, remember, by divine inspiration, on persons who falsify the gospel. Now here are people who are preaching the truth, though not truthfully in spirit. And because the word is getting out, he, Paul, who really rejoices in Christ, and those whom Christ would say, he throws his hat up in the air. He smiles even when it hurts to smile because he is being injured by these people who nevertheless are blessing him inadvertently by promoting the cause to which he devotes his life. Now, implicit in that is the answer to your question there. Why would Paul be happy about people who are trying, devoting all their energies to make him unhappy and indeed Christ unhappy because after all Christ commands that we should love him and these people don't love him, they just love whatever goes with the preaching of his gospel and so on. Well, the reason, here again we have to read between the lines, but the reason, let me read the text once again to, uh, before I explain what I'm saying here. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense, or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Now, why does he rejoice in it? Well, he rejoices in it because Christ is the Savior of the world. And the only way anybody's ever going to be brought to him is through the truth about him. I mentioned to you before how Walter Martin says there are at least ten different definitions of Jesus running around loose in the world at the present time. I'm sure there are more than ten. But you know only one of those can possibly be true. So multitudes of people who are defining Christ wrongly and with that wrong definition are wrongly supposing themselves to be Christians are fatally in error. They've never even heard the gospel. They don't know who Jesus Christ is. They're dead in trespasses and sins and no good news has come to them. Nothing but a perversion of it. That's a tragedy. A real tragedy, but manifestly. Nobody can be saved except by Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has to be preached as he really is. He can't be a figment of a person's imagination. That is another gospel which is no gospel. And anybody who's interested in the salvation of souls knows the first thing you've got to get to people is the saving message. And these people are getting the saving message the people, and Paul is rejoicing because people can be saved, even though the minister himself is unsaved. Here is the irony of the matter, as the question earlier brought out. These people, then and now, who preach the true Christ of a false motive, can be the instrument of other persons' salvation, even while they are the instruments of their own damnation, without question the deepest pit in hell is going to be reserved for preachers. The pagans will be lost. 
The false religionists will be lost. The multitude who have no vision therefore perish will be lost. But the deepest places in hell are going to be for those who know most and believe least, who preach the greatest truth from the wickedest motivation. And yet the irony of the matter is, the blessedness of the matter, the thing that gives Paul his ground for rejoicing is that other people are saved by it. Go back to me once again. I just talk about myself because you're looking at me. Even the people in the videotape will see me, so you can visualize me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I am teaching, I think, is the truth. If it is the truth, people can be, and through my 45 years of ministry, have been saved by it. Now, I could be a preacher of ill will, and it could theoretically be selfish ambition which has motivated me all the way, and particularly the fact that I can point with pride, as I'm doing right now, to the fact that some people have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son through my preaching. And manifestly, if that be true, then I am just adding wrath to wrath. Every soul that ever be saved or sanctified by any ministry of mine will just be one more stick I have put on my fire because what I am doing I'm doing not because I love the gospel, which I preach, which brings the salvation to people, but because I love myself in that particular form. You can see it's so gruesome that as I see, you realize, I think these people have to be in the deepest pit of hell. I have to be. One thing is certain, if I'm lost, I'm going to be pushing Judas Iscariot. In the nature of the case, those to whom much is given, much will be required. This is the most choice privilege anybody has, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to prosecute it or pervert it, or to incriminate yourself by wrong motivation. No. Paul mentions this, you remember, in 1 Corinthians. In another connection, he's talking there about self-discipline. Here he's talking about motivation. There he's talking about self-discipline, but the principle's the same. Remember how he says, I beat my body, bring it into subjection, lest while I preach to others, I myself be a castaway. The apostle made it perfectly clear that though he was the apostle of Jesus Christ, that he would be a Judas Iscariot. He would be a false apostle, preaching the truth, just as Judas did. When it came to the day of judgment, he would himself be a castaway, and had no use trying to put that on that, that term, as so many people do. He put on the shelf, he'd no longer be useful. This means a reject. This means a person is repudiated by Jesus Christ because Christ is a searcher of hearts and he knows precisely what motivates men. Christ himself, you remember, in Matthew 7 puts it this way. In that day, the day of judgment, they shall say to me, Lord, Lord, here's John Gerstner now, standing before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and saying the absolute truth, Lord, Lord, haven't I prophesied in thy name? That's what I'm doing right now. March the 11th, 1984, Eastminster Presbyterian Church. Haven't I prophesied in thy name? Haven't I cast out devils in thy name? Meaning by that, haven't devils been cast out of people through the preaching of the gospel which has come from my lips through the years? Haven't I done many mighty works in thy name? And if I'm the kind of person I'm describing right now, what's Jesus going to be saying to me? He tells in that passage in Matthew 7, Depart from me. You, John Gerstner, worker of iniquity, I never knew you. He doesn't call me a liar. He doesn't say I didn't prophesy in his name. I'm sure as God is in his heaven that this is prophesying in his name and it would be recognized as such at the day of judgment. And Christ is not saying, why are you lying to me, Gerstner? You never prophesied in my name. No devils were ever cast out by your preaching. You never did any mighty work. No, no, not at all. He doesn't deny any of that. And I wouldn't be, idiot as I am, I wouldn't be foolish enough to try to pull the wool over the judgment of God at the last day. What's he say? Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. My prophesying, in other words, is a work of iniquity. Why? Because Christ never knew me, and I never knew Christ, and I never loved Christ. And I was motivated by any devotion to Christ. The only thing that kept me going 
with selfish ambition or ill will or desire to hurt competitors or something like that. Not because of any love for Christ. So Christ says to me, I never knew you, John Gershner. And he calls me a worker of iniquity, even though he doesn't deny that I prophesied in his name and cast out devils in his name and done many mighty works in his name. What he denies is that he knows me or that I know him or that anything that I've ever done has had anything to do with my devotion to the Christ whom I have actually uh, preached. Does that answer your question, my friend? <laughs> it certainly uh, seems to me that this passage shows very clearly that Paul rejoices in people who hate him and who hate Christ if they preach the gospel just as truly as he anathematizes people who preach a gospel which is not, uh, uh, not another gospel at all. He says in, in number eight here, because this the very ill will of some ministers is going to turn out for deliverance. I put for, from sin for goodwill preachers. He doesn't mention how that's going to promote his deliverance. It's a little difficult to know what he did have in mind there. But he is sure of this. It's going to promote his uh, deliverance. These people who hate him and are jealous of him and are preaching against him and such things as him, they're advancing his cause for his deliverance. Does he mean from prison? He is delivered from prison. This is the first imprisonment, you remember, not the final one, and so on. How that would be, I don't know. So my speculation here, because I'm not sure, certain what the apostle has in mind here, my speculation is that it would promote greater deliverance from sin. It would be a great blessing to him. The very fact that these people hate him and are trying to plot his ruin and are doing evil to him and are falsely motivated themselves leads him to rejoice in the providence of God. So he himself is actually rejoicing because Christ has preached and their animosity to him who preached Christ falsely, of course, doesn't do him any harm. He has incurred it because of his very fidelity. So the more they hate him in a certain sense, the more terrible it is for him. For them, the better it is for him. Why? Because he's suffering for righteousness' sake. They're adding stars to his crown. I presume that's the type of deliverance he means. Ultimately, it does lead to the deliverance from prison. It's possible he had a reference to that, but I think he had in mind a far greater deliverance. Number nine, but that comes about not because of the ill will of false preachers of truth, but by the prayers of saints and the Spirit of God. It's in spite of the ill will of people. They don't want to advance the cause of the Apostle Paul, but they do it. And where do you come in on this? If people hate you for your righteousness' sake, they can't harm you. They'll harm themselves by hurting you. They'll only promote your well-being. These circumstances are going to turn out for your good. As I say, what's tragedy? How do you spell it? There is no such word in the Christian vocabulary. Unpleasant, adverse, and so on. But all of these things just promote your deliverance. So you rejoice in tribulation. You don't, as I say, collapse under it. Finally, the end result is that Paul's confidence is confirmed rather than embarrassed because Christ is exalted even in his body whether he is executed or allowed to live. I just one minute left, but let me call your attention in closing here to that fact that the apostle uh, appreciates the opportunity of serving Jesus Christ in his body. The Christian view of the body, you remember, is that God made it and it's good and the command he has given us is to love God with all our strength. So whatever energy we have, whatever health we have, we should use in his service. And if we expend ourselves in it, we rejoice in it. If we are afflicted because of it, we're glad of that. If we're actually put to death in literal martyrdom and so on, that makes us happier still because we're actually glorifying God with our body. We belong to him entirely. He's purchased us completely. And everything that we are, everything that we have, everything we say, everything that we do, and especially everything that we suffer, imprisonment, death, reproach, whatever it is, <laughs> to us, it's so much blessing. It works together for our deliverance. And those who seek to hurt us actually only help us. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, help us to remain and meditate upon thy word. Help us to continue to contemplate thy truth and like Mary to store these things in our heart. And that understanding may come and practice may follow and that we may be shining lights in a dark world and men, whatever they think of us, may come to know and love thee and us ultimately. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.
me recently that the, uh, that the line between a policeman and a criminal was, was very small, <laughs> in the same way with a minister and a con man. come to these things as these ministers did and so on. You can do it in your work, I can do it.